Well, good morning, Journey Church, and Happy New Year. If you are a newcomer, if you're visiting with us, so glad you're able to join us. My name is Pastor Dave. I'm actually the pastor of Journey. I've actually been away with my family on a sabbatical for the past six months, but it's great to be back in community. Uh, we feel very rested, and we're excited to be back. I just want to thank many of you who have been very faithful during my time away, and also just want to thank Symphony Church, who really took care and shepherded our church while my family and I were able to take uh, much needed rest. And so I just want to, again, thank many of you. Thank you to Symphony uh, for my time away. And again, just for really your, your faithfulness uh, while my family and I were able to, uh, again, get some much needed rest. So just thank you again. Just wanted to share a few logistical things before we get into God's Word. Number one, we're going to still continue to meet in our micro churches. I know the micro churches were implemented by Symphony while we were away. And so we're going to continue to meet in that model for Duke and for UNC and for young adults. Uh, please gather together in your groups on Sunday. Uh, have a time of worship. Also watch a video message and have a time of fellowship. We're going to still encourage you to do that uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, if you're not part of a micro church, you could join one through our website. And just a couple of announcements also just wanted to uh, mention is that uh, once a month, we're actually going to be having gatherings for both young adult and for college. For young adults, uh, please note that on January 20th, which is a Thursday, uh, we're going to be coming together. And the purpose of these gatherings is simply that we want to have a time of fellowship, but also talk about young adult related topics when it comes to young adults and also for the, uh, living the Christian life. And so the first one, again, is going to be on January 20th. You can find more information on our website. And another date to keep in mind is on January 23rd. We're going to be coming all together as a church to worship together. Our college gathering, more details will be uh, mentioned later on as we figure out you know, the situations with the campuses, especially uh, with the pandemic going on. And so, again, all this information will be found on our website. So please head there if you need uh, any details of what's going on in our church. And just lastly, uh, after my message, if you feel led, uh, you can give your tithes and offering and your giving through our website, through Venmo and PayPal. So uh, please keep that in mind. Well, I'm really excited to share God's word. I'm really excited to be back. Uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And the series that we want to start is called Transformed, How God Changes Us. Transformed, How God Changes Us. And the title of today's message is called the transform life, the transform life. And really my challenge and my conviction as we go into this year is really talking about how do we actually transform? How does the gospel transform us from the inside out? And I really hope and my prayer for all of us is that God would do a mighty work in our lives. That God would give us, again, power in our lives that we experience his freedom that he so freely gives through the gospel. So with that being said, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. If you've been around church, these passages are probably very familiar to you, but I'm going to start at verse 1. This is what the Apostle Paul writes. He says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's bow our heads and pray before we get into God's word. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for allowing my family and I to step away and take a sabbatical. And thank you for many, many people in our church who have been faithful during our time away. God, we want to start this new year with just, again, a promise of hope. That God, you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God, I pray that as we start this series, that you would help us to experience freedom as we desire to change and become more like you. And so speak to us through your word. We depend on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't get to watch a lot of TV, but one of the favorite genres of shows that my wife and I like to watch are shows of transformation. A couple examples. A couple years ago, there used to be a show called The Biggest Loser. And it would be about these 12 contestants who would be on the show. And really, the whole point is to lose weight 
but more importantly, to live a healthy lifestyle. And so they would get these trainers and they would rigorously train and be on this regimented diet. And it would be remarkable. If you watch episode one, to the very last episode, not only how much weight they lost, but really their lifestyle change they made in their life. And it would be just, uh, just a, a life of transformation. Another kind of show that my wife and I like to watch are shows on HDTV. So shows like Fixer Upper or Property Brothers because what they would do is they would buy these old uh, raggedy old homes. They would put, put a lot of work into it and what would be created at the very end would be these uh, beautiful, magnificent homes that everyone wanted to live in and wanted to buy. And I love stories like that because they are stories of transformation. And what the gospel reminds us of is simply that God desires to transform our lives. The gospel is simply not that God loves us and forgives us, even though that is a radical part of the message in the gospel of Christ, but God also wants to change our lives inside out. That's why he calls us a new creation. And so that's what we wanna talk about in this series. Now, when we talk about change, I know that many of us, we get discouraged because there are probably areas in your life where you wanted God to change. Certain areas in your life, but it hasn't happened. And so you try religion, you try living a good life, you try to be more moral, but you realize that God hasn't really, or really our hearts haven't really changed and you feel like God hasn't really changed our lives. Maybe areas where you feel like maybe you're selfish and you want God to help you to be selfless in some areas of your life. Maybe your time or maybe your energy that you spend. Maybe in certain areas you want to be more generous. Maybe you feel like you want to be more generous with your money or with your possessions. Maybe there are certain areas where you want to be more loving. There are people in your life where it's hard to forgive or hard to love and you want to be more loving to those people. Maybe some of us, we've just had habits or addictions that we've had for many, many years, habitual habits that we've wanted freedom from. And what the gospel reminds us of is that there is hope for change, that God wants to change us from the inside out. And as a result, he wants us to experience freedom. There is great freedom when the gospel infects our lives and gives us change and transformation. So that's what this series is all about. I'm really excited. I really hope that you're excited as well as we look at this topic of transformation and different areas where I feel like God wants to change us in our lives. And so we're going to start at Romans chapter 12, but to give you a little context, I just want to start by giving you a little bit of background of where we're at. Romans chapter 12 obviously falls right, right after Romans chapters 1 through 11. Now, if you ever read the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1 through 11, Paul is giving us biblical theology. He's really giving us a theology of what God has done in our lives, really of how we deserve wrath and judgment, how we don't deserve salvation, but because of what Christ has done, we are justified, meaning that we have right standing with God. And through that, it's Paul is giving us the good news of the gospel, but he's laying out all these theological terms. And in chapter 12 and on, he gives us imperatives of how to live our life. In light of what the gospel has done, this is how you ought to live your life. And the word that he uses to go about this transition is the word therefore. That's the key word in this whole passage. Really, as Paul talks about chapters 1 through 11, he hinges chapter 12 by saying, therefore, this is how you ought to live. This is how God ought to change you in your life and in community and so on. And so that's where we pick up Paul's uh, letter here. And starting at chapter 12, that's where we're going to pick up. We're going to kind of do a Bible study, word study as we go into this passage. And I just want to give us two points here. And the first one is this, that transformation happens by living a life of devotion. Transformation happens by living a life of devotion. A couple words here that we want to highlight. He first talks about this idea to present or to offer. And what do we offer? We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. First of all, he says we are called to present and to offer. Now, this word actually means that we continually present an offering to God. 
So it's not just a one-time thing. Like we bring a sacrifice or we offer ourselves to God one time. Like maybe you said a prayer when you're in high school and you say, God, I want to live for you. And it's a one-time thing. But what Paul is talking about here is simply continually giving ourselves to God. And he says, what do we give? We give our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, many of the readers back in those days would actually be familiar with this imagery because it was Jewish imagery imagery that pointed to Old Testament sacrifice. And back in those days, the Old Testament sacrifice usually signified two things. It would be an atonement to God, meaning that as you offer a dead animal, that you would have right standing with God, and also an offering of thanksgiving. We all, we continue to give uh, worship and praise, and we all give it worship, uh, an offering to God through our worship. And so as he talks about this idea of sacrifice, it's very unique because Paul actually makes it very distinct in the way that he talks about this idea of sacrifice. A couple ways that it's very distinct. Number one, he calls it a living sacrifice. Back in those days, you need to remember that before Christ, that we needed to offer a dead sacrifice, a dead animal that was consecrated to be acceptable to God. But because of what Jesus has done, because he was the ultimate sacrifice, we no longer need to bring a dead animal because he's already paid that price. He was the Lamb of God that was slain for our sins. But what he's saying here is this, not a dead animal anymore, but what we ought to give as a sacrifice and our worship to God is that we ought to give our bodies. What Paul is saying is simply this, that all of ourselves, our entire selves, right? Uh, our physical and our spiritual existence, our will and our desires and our abilities and our talents, that's what should be offered to God. That's really what Paul is saying here as he talks about every single day, I am, I am called to offer myself as a living sacrifice, all of myself, my desires, my will, my ability to God as an act of worship. I love what Tim Keller says. He puts it like this. To be a living sacrifice is to be fully at God's disposal. It means actively to be willing to obey God in anything he says in any area of life and passively to be willing to thank God for anything he sends in any area of our lives. I love that because I think that summarizes what Paul is saying here, that we are called to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And that's really the point of where transformation begins. So here's the challenge for us. As we head into 2022, and as we head into this upcoming year, can you say that all of ourselves is devoted to God? That we want to give all of ourselves as an offering to God? Maybe it's the area of time. Maybe you feel like your time is yours. And God is reminding us that as we give of ourselves, that actually our time is supposed to be used for the Lord. Maybe it's the gifts that God has given you, your talents, your abilities. It's not just to build our own little kingdoms, but rather we're supposed to build his kingdom. Maybe it's in the area of our finances. We often think that our finances is ours and we get to spend our money and our finances in any way that we want. But to offer ourselves a living sacrifice is to really ask the question, God, how do you want me to spend my finances? What areas do you want me to be generous in? That's what it means to live a life of devotion. And what Paul is saying here is that that's how transformation starts. If you and I want to be changed this upcoming year, we need to make a commitment to continually offering ourselves to God. It means maybe every morning starting ourselves saying to God, God, I want to offer myself. I want to offer this area of my life, my desires, my will, my wishes to you, Lord. And through that, that's where transformation starts. The second part of this sacrifice that's very distinct, Paul says that it's a holy sacrifice. Now this word holy, it simply means to be set apart, to be separate. Uh, to be a living sacrifice and to be holy simply means that we are set apart for God. And so part of this idea of a living sacrifice is not only do we offer ourselves, but we also are set apart to be used by God in any way that he wants us to be used. Now, this word holy, it's really hard to define because we don't use it in today's standards. Uh, the best way I can think about this idea of holy is that growing up, 
Uh, I remember my mom had this set of fine china and it would be put in this special drawer, this glass cabinet. And I remember that we would never eat out of this fine china, but only when we had special guests over, right? People who visited from out of town, would she take out this fine china and serve food on it because she wanted to impress the guests that were over. In the same way that these dishes were set apart for a special occasion, that's how God wants us to also uh, live as well. That to be a holy sacrifice is simply saying that I set apart my life to be an instrument of God, is to present ourselves holy and righteous before God. It means simply this, Lord, my eyes, my feet, my body, my will is an instrument for God's use. It's not an instrument for sin or to live any way that I want, but it's really used for the glory of God. So in the area of sexual ethics or words or the way that we love and forgive people, we need to understand that we are called to be set apart to be used by the Lord. The third word that we see here, not only do we offer ourselves, not only are we a living sacrifice, but Paul says here that this is our spiritual act of worship, our spiritual act of worship. This is what is pleasing to God. Right? Oftentimes back in the Old Testament, you would have to bring in a, a dead animal or an offering to God to please the Lord. What it's saying here is that what pleases the Lord is that when we offer ourselves as a sacrifice, to God. Now, what's really interesting is that this word spiritual worship is translated into logical, logical or reasonable worship. And so the best way to put it is simply this. It's worship that makes sense. And so putting it all together, this is what Paul is saying here. In light of what God has done, and I think the, the key phrase here is that in view of God's mercy, in view of God's grace, our logical reasoning or step is that we offer ourselves to the Lord. We offer our lives to the Lord, that we are set apart for the Lord in view of His mercy. Now, we need to understand that the motivation behind all this, again, is not to earn God's favor, but the key word here is that we look at the mercies of God. Mercy being that it's undeserved grace, that in and of ourselves, we cannot save ourselves, that we actually deserve judgment and the wrath of God, but in view of God's mercies, His never-ending grace for us, that we are, what? Our logical response is that we give our lives to Him. You see, I think that's what Paul is saying here when he's saying, talking about this idea of transforming our lives. Uh, this past six months has been very great for my family and I. I've been able to get a lot of rest, do a lot of reflecting, uh, spend some time with the Lord, but one of the things that I was reflecting upon is simply as a minister and as a pastor, and as a Christian, to think about why I do the things that I do, right? Why in the Christian life do I study God's word or to preach a message or to love or try to love people or to, uh, you know, lead people as best as I can? And when I realized that for a while, I was doing that because what I thought was I was trying to earn favor from God. I was trying to earn favor from God. If I do this, then God will be pleased with me. But I think what Paul reminds us of in this passage for all of us here is that we've already earned the favor of God in view of God's mercy, in view of what God has done for us, in light of his death and resurrection, in light of his unchanging and unfailing love for us, that's when we give ourselves to the Lord. I think this is so important because I think many, many times our motivation is wrong in serving God. I think many, many times it's to maybe, uh, you know, impress people. Maybe we feel like we need to earn favor from God. But I really hope that the one thing that we take away from this message is that in view of God's grace and mercy and His love for us, that's where we serve. That's where we give ourselves to the Lord. The second point I want to just make here is simply that transformation happens by continually renewing our minds. Transformation happens continually by renewing our minds. Now, for the rest of this passage, he gives us two commands. He says, 
Do not conform or don't conform to the pattern of this world. But he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. First of all, he gives us a warning. He says, don't be conformed by the pattern of this world. Simply this, don't buy in or live like the world is living. Think about the way that the world lives. The world ignores God. The world despises God. The, the world often live at, lives as though there is no God. And so what Paul is saying here is that don't conform to that pattern. Don't conform to the culture around you. Now, what does it mean when Paul simply means that, you know, we are not to conform? Are we called to be like weird or, you know, not be around people that are not believing? I, that, that's not what Paul is saying here. I think the best way to put it is I like this one uh, quote by this pastor named R.C. Sproul. He puts it like this. We are conformists from the time we are born until the time we die. We always feel peer pressure, the tug and struggle to be in line with the contemporary tastes and standards. Christ calls us to a special kind of nonconformity, a refusal to conform to the sinful patterns of the world, to patterns of disobedience. He goes on to say, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. He's saying, don't go as the world is going. Don't live your life as the world is living. But he says this, he goes, but you be transformed. Be different, be transformed, be changed by what? He says, the renewing of your mind. Now, this word transform is in the Greek, it's literally the word metamorpho. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. He says, you and I are called to be radically different, radically transformed from the world. Uh, I remember when my kids were a little bit younger, uh, I used to read this book called The Hungry Little Caterpillar. I'm sure many of us are familiar with it, uh, but I vaguely remember what this book is about. But what I do remember is it would be this little caterpillar who just ate everything in sight apple or banana or all these different fruits, leaves. And at the very end of the book, it would turn itself into a cocoon and metamorphosize or, you know, radically change into this beautiful butterfly. And when I think about that story, that's what the gospel message tells us as well. That's what Paul is saying to us as well. That's what the gospel does in our lives. It changes us from the inside out. Addictions can be broken, right? We can find power in our lives to be free, to become different, to become more like Christ. That is the power of the gospel. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says, And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. He goes on in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. And the key to all this, he says, is through our minds. It's by what we think, what we think about, what we you know, think about on a daily basis. He said the transformation starts in our minds. And so I like that because he's, he's saying that we don't throw our intellect away when it comes to the Christian life, but rather it starts with our minds. You see, I really believe that the gospel is not just for the unbeliever, but it's for the believer as well. Because as we are renewing our minds, we are reminded of the mercies of God. We are saturated by God's word and his promises. And through that, our lives are being changed each and every day. Day. And I love what he says here. As a result of that, we know what the will of God is. We will know God's perfect, pleasing, acceptable will in our lives. Now, I, the word that he uses here is that we will be able to test God's will. This word test is translated to, to prove genuine. It's referring to this idea of when metals were tested, you would have to test it to see which metals were good and were able to be used rather than ones that were not good to be used. And so that's the same idea Paul is saying here. As God renews our as we renew our minds towards being more like Jesus, what happens is we are able to discern God's will in our lives. Maybe for some of us, we don't know what God's will is. And I think the first place to start 
is that we need to allow God to renew our minds. We need to allow God to change our minds and our hearts so that we can discern the will of God in our lives. I think many of us want that. I think many of us desire that. I know I desire that in my life as well. So where does that lead us? Where does that lead us? I just want to give us just three simple takeaways that I really hope that you would implement not only this week, but this upcoming year. And the first place, the first one is this, we need to be committed to the word. I feel like every January, I say this, we need to commit ourselves to the word. Right now is a great time to start a Bible reading plan or to get into God's word. Start anew. Maybe you feel like last year, you really didn't read the Bible much. Start now. If you have a hard time, start a Bible reading plan. Get accountability. Be in community. Listen to sermons. But the way that God primarily transforms our mind is simply through God's word. If you want to discern the will of God in your life, we need to be in the will. We need to be in God's word. That's how we are changed, not only in our minds, but in our hearts and in our lives. One scholar puts it like this, fill your head with scripture, hymns, novels, and songs, which will strengthen your mind to understand and articulate your faith. Christian faith cannot bide into intellectual laziness. The second thing here is to daily offer your lives as a living sacrifice. It's to daily offer up our lives as a living sacrifice. I want to challenge you this upcoming year, each and every morning, to pray a prayer of surrender and say, Lord, today, help me to be a living sacrifice. Lord, in view of your mercy, in view of your grace, help me to offer up myself, every area of my life, my relationships, my finances, my times with you, my private times. I want to be a living sacrifice because, Lord, I want my life to be acceptable and pleasing to you. And as we do that, I really believe that's when the Spirit comes and changes us. The third and final thing is this. Will you remember and be motivated by His mercy? Remember and be motivated by His mercy. There is no offering. There is no work. There is no sacrifice. There is no service that you and I can do to bring about salvation in our life or to earn the favor of God. It's all a gift. And God has already done that for us. And I believe and I pray that if that is the motivating factor of our lives, the way that we do go about Christian life will be radically different. My prayer for you is that you and I will be reminded of the gospel each and every day. That God saved a person like me and you from the depths of judgment by His radical grace. And out of that we say, Lord, I offer myself to you as a living sacrifice. I love this hymn writer, and he writes this. He says, Where the whole realm of nature mine, that were present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Just take a minute just to pray, and again, if you could just really ask the Lord to speak to you. And I don't know how your 2001 was, but... I really believe that as we head into a new year, start a new year, uh, God wants to transform you. There are areas in your life where God wants to do a mighty work. But it also requires for us to daily offer ourselves to the Lord. And also requires for us to be renewed in our minds by His Word. So can you, through the Holy Spirit, maybe the Spirit's convicting you, maybe make a commitment to Him. Make a commitment now. And say, Lord... As best as I can, I want to do this for you. Do that for a minute and I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. Lord, thank you for our church. And Lord, I pray that this year will be a year of transformation. God, I pray that we would desire change in our lives. Because, that, Lord, that's what you want from us. I pray that addictions would be uh, broken so we could experience your freedom. I pray that we would 
be people who are willing to love and to forgive people that it's hard to love. God, only you can do that. Lord, help us to make these small steps so that we could become more like you. We thank you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, please give your tithes and offering right after my message. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, Please join us next Sunday. See you next week.